December 1, 1897, Arizona Weekly Journal Minor, Prescott, Arizona. Eel blood for snake bite. Some years ago, the naturalist Massa found that the blood of eels, particularly that of sea eels, contained a poison which acted, when transferred into the human system, similar to the venom of vipers, although weaker, inasmuch as the eel poison brought about similar reduction of the temperature of the blood as the snake poison. Based upon this fact, Professor C. Faselix made very interesting researches, which he presented recently to the Academy of Sciences at Paris. He concluded that the blood of eels possessed immunifying agencies upon snake poison. He succeeded by heating a solution of eel poison to 58 degrees Celsius to destroy its virulence, so that it was possible to inoculate a guinea pig with the fluid, the only effect being the raising of the temperature by a few degrees. This reaction of the organism was followed by a perfect capability to resist the poison of the vipers, which was administered in a deadly dose 15 to 20 hours after the inoculation with eel blood, but it absolutely failed to kill the animal. Even a very small quantity of the heated eel serum was sufficient to produce immunity from snake poison. This discovery is most important, since it can be employed for immunifying human beings against snake bites, and, if not too far progressed, it will even ensure a more rapid recovery from snake bite of victims who had not previously been immunified with the serum. Philadelphia Record September 21, 1887, Mainland Guardian, New Westminster, B.C. Strange Remedies In an article on strange medicines in the 19th century, Miss Cumming quotes a few of the healing spells which are to this day practiced by the peasantry of various districts in Great Britain and which are considered certain remedies. The Northumbrian cure for warts is to take a large snail rub the wart well with it, and then impale the snail on a thorn hedge. As the creature wastes away, the warts will surely disappear. In the west of England, eel's blood serves the same purpose. For goiter or when, the hand of a dead child must be rubbed nine times across the lump, or, still better, the hand of a suicide may be substituted. In the vicinity of Stamfordham in Northumberland, Whooping cough is cured by putting the head of a live trout into the patient's mouth and letting the trout breathe into the latter. Or else a hairy caterpillar is put into a small bag and tied around the child's neck. The cough ceases as the insect dies. Another cure for whooping cough is offerings of hair. In Sunderland, the crown of the head is shaved and the hair hung upon a bush or tree with the full faith that as the birds carry away the hair, so will the cough vanish. In Lincolnshire, a girl suffering from the ague cuts a lock of her hair and binds it around an aspen tree, praying the latter to shake in her stead. In Rossshire, where living cocks are still occasionally buried as a sacrificial remedy for epilepsy, some of the hair of the patient is generally added to the offering. At least one holy well in Ireland, that of Tubercoon, requires an offering of hair from all Christian pilgrims who come here on the last three Sundays in June to worship St. Coon. As a charm against toothache, it is necessary to go thrice around a neighboring tree on the bare knees and then cut off a lock of hair and tie it to a branch. The tree thus fringed with human hair of all colors is a curious sight and one of deep veneration. The remedy for a toothache at Tavistock in Devonshire is to bite a tooth from a skull in the churchyard and keep it always in the pocket. Spiders are largely concerned in the cure of ague. In Ireland, the sufferer is advised to swallow a living spider. In Somerset and the neighboring counties, he is to shut a large black spider in a box and leave it to perish. Even in New England, a lingering faith in the superstitions of another country leads to the manufacture of spider web pills for the cure of ague, and Longfellow tells of a popular cure for fever. 
by wearing a spider hung round one's neck in a nutshell. This was the approved remedy of our British ancestors for fever and ague, and in Sussex, a live spider rolled up in butter is still considered good in cases of obstinate jaundice. At Loch Heron in Rosher, an occasional cure for erbsilis is to cut off half the ear of a cat and let the blood drip on the inflamed surface. In Cornwall, the treatment for the removal of whelks or small pimples from the eyelids of children is to pass the tail of a black cat nine times over the part affected. In Devonshire, the approved treatment for scrofula is to dry the hind leg of a toad and wear it around the neck in a silk bag, or else to cut off that part of the living reptile that answers to the part affected. And, having wrapped the fragment in parchment, to tie it around the sufferer's neck. In the same county, the wise man's remedy for rheumatism is to burn a toad to ashes and tie the dust in a bit of silk to be worn around the throat. Toads are made to do service in diverse manners in Cornwall and Northampton for the cure of nose bleeding and quinsy, while toad powder or even a live toad or spider shut in a box is still in some places accounted as useful as a charm against contagion as it was in the time of Sir Kenelm Digby. The old smallpox and dropsy remedy was nothing more or less than powdered toad. Frogs, too, are considered remedial. Thus, frog spawn placed in a stone jar for three months till it turns to water has been considered wonderfully efficacious in Donegal when rubbed into a rheumatic limb. In Aberdeenshire, a cure for sore eyes is to lick the eyes of a live frog. A man thus healed has thenceforth the power of curing all sore eyes by licking them. In like manner, in Ireland, it is believed that the tongue that has licked a lizard all over will be forever endowed with the power of healing whatever sore or pain it touches. Another Irish remedy is to apply a fox's tongue to draw a thorn from the foot. The tooth of a living fox, worn as an amulet, is deemed a cure for an inflamed leg. For deep-seated thorns, the application of a cast-off snakeskin is efficacious, not to attract the thorn, but to expel it from the opposite side of hand or foot. In some of the Hebridean Isles, notably that of Lewis, the greatest faith prevails in the efficacy of perforated water-worn stones called snake stones. These are dipped into water, which is then given to cattle as a cure for swelling or for snake bite. If the stone is unattainable, the head of an adder dipped in the water gives an equally good result. In Devonshire, any person bitten by a viper is advised to kill the creature at once and rub the wound with its fat. It is said that this practice has survived in some portions of the United States, where the flesh of the rattlesnake is accounted the best cure for its own bite. Black, in his folk medicine, states that the belief in the power of the snake skin as a cure for rheumatism still exists in New England. Such a belief is probably a direct heritage from Britain. In Durham, an eel skin worn as a garter round the naked leg is considered a preventative of cramp, while in Northumberland it is esteemed the best bandage for a sprained limb. So, too, in Sussex, the approved cure for a swollen neck is to draw a snake nine times across the throat of the sufferer, after which the snake is killed, and its skin sewed in a piece of silk and worn round the patient's neck. Sometimes the snake is put in a bottle, which is tightly corked and buried in the ground, and it is expected that, as the victim decays, the swelling will subside.